Well, good morning again, church. So, what was the fruit that Adam and Eve ate? How many of you saying an apple out there? <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought you'd say. But you know, if you look at the Bible, it doesn't really ever say what the actual forbidden fruit was. And you might be interested to know that it is only the Christians of the West that believe it was an apple. Scholars believe that that might be related to the fact that the Christians in the West originally spoke Latin. And the Latin word for apple is malum which is almost identical to the Latin word for evil, which is malus. And so since evil flowed from eating the forbidden fruit, the Western Church made a connection between evil, malus, and the apple, malum. Jews, however, don't believe that the forbidden fruit was an apple. Anybody know what they say? Well, they believe that the forbidden fruit was a fig. You see, one Jewish midrash, or teaching, observes that Adam and Eve sewed fig leaves together to clothe themselves after eating the forbidden fruit. Remember that? Well, the Midrash concludes that God is so full of mercy and compassion that he knew if Adam and Eve ate the forbidden fruit, they would realize that they were naked and therefore they would need a remedy for their nakedness. And so, in the very tree that would prove to be their downfall, God provided a remedy for that evil, even before it happened, even from the very same instrument of that evil, in this case, a fig tree. Now, in our first reading from the book of Chronicles, we hear the story of the Israelites' exile from Israel into Babylon, and then their ultimate return to Jerusalem. The writer concludes that Israel's infidelity led to its destruction and captivity by the pagan king of the Chaldeans, who then exiled them into Babylon. But then the writer also concludes that God inspired another pagan king, Cyrus of Persia, to free the Israelites once the Persians conquered the Chaldeans. Now in each case, a pagan king is the instrument of Israel's captivity and of its liberation. And in both cases, God is at work. In the pagan king that proves to be Israel's downfall, God provides a remedy of liberation in another pagan king. For as the Jewish Midrash teaches, God is so full of mercy and compassion that he provides for the remedy of an evil even before it happens, and even by the, the very same instrument of that evil. 
Now, one of the hardest things for us Christians to do is to come to terms with the evil in our lives and in our world. We cringe at the evil around us, such as our nation's strained race relations, which continues to play out not only in places like Ferguson, but in our own city. And some of our U.S. Senators' seeming preference for confronting our enemies with violence instead of negotiation. And we struggle with that evil, as well as the evil in which we personally participate. Our own brokenness, our own failings, our own sinfulness. The majority of Catholics still avoid the sacrament of reconciliation, in which we're asked to acknowledge our failings and sinfulness before God. Perhaps we're afraid that God might punish us or that we might never overcome our sin. And so we often deny our feelings, our failings, or our sinfulness, even though they're very much a part of our lives. Yet whether we are willing to acknowledge our sinfulness or not, we still have to live with the consequences of our actions. People who misuse alcohol or drugs or even cigarettes may get sick not as a punishment from God, but as a consequence of their own actions. Those who act abusively towards others, whether physically or emotionally, may find themselves isolated in their abusiveness. Again, not as a punishment from God, but as a consequence of their own actions. And people who are selfish or overly materialistic may find themselves over their head in debt and financial problems, not as punishment from God, but as a consequence of their own actions. You see, evil flows from our wrongdoing, and there's not much any of us can do about that. But if we ever want to remedy our sinfulness, if we ever want to heal our brokenness, then we have to be willing to face the evil in our lives head on. And if we want to do that, then we need to see God as the remedy of our wrongdoing not as the punishment for it. You see, Christians over the centuries have come to understand the story of Adam and Eve as a story of God's punishment. We call it the story of original sin. But Jews actually see the story of Adam and Eve as a story of God's compassion. God was so merciful and compassionate that he provided a remedy for the evil in our lives even before it happened, and even by the very same instrument of that evil. And they interpret the story of the Babylonian exile in the same way. God's mercy and compassion led the Jews to liberty through a pagan king after another pagan king had been the instrument of their captivity. Now, as Christians, we see the reality of God's mercy and compassion through our understanding of grace. In his letter to the Ephesians, for example, St. Paul writes this, God, who is rich in mercy because of the great love he had for us, brought us to life with Christ. 
For by grace have you been saved through faith. And this is not from you. It is the gift of God. The starting point for St. Paul is the same starting point for the Jewish tradition. God is rich in mercy and compassion. And then St. John builds on this when he sums up the entire gospel with these words. God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him might not perish, but might have eternal life. Again, for St. John, Jesus Christ, the Son, is the source of our salvation, not our condemnation. Sin may carry evil consequences with it, but it is the Son who is the remedy for it. In fact, this is where the Christian understanding of grace dovetails with the Jewish understanding of God's mercy and compassion. The instrument that is at the heart of the evil of crucifixion, the cross, is the very instrument that is at the heart of our salvation. In the cross of Jesus Christ, God provides the remedy for the evil of our sin. Even before that sin happens, and even by the very same instrument of that sin. And so the cross needs to be our starting point when we confront the evil in our own lives and in our world. Every time we look at the cross of Jesus Christ, we remember that God can take the very instrument of our brokenness and transform it into the instrument of our healing. So that every time we look at our own brokenness in life, the crosses that we carry, we remember with confidence and hope that God can take our brokenness and transform it into an instrument of our healing. We need to fight the temptation to look away from evil in our lives and in our world. Because by looking away from evil, we are in essence looking away from the cross of Jesus Christ. Only when we acknowledge that we have failed to care for ourselves, or that we have been neglectful or even abusive of others, or that we've been selfish and greedy for material things, only then can we call upon the grace of God to transform those evils into a remedy. Only when our society is ready to acknowledge the persistent patterns of racism in our institutions, only when we can acknowledge that many of us have tendencies towards resolving disputes by violence instead of negotiation, only then can we call upon the grace of God to transform those evils into a remedy. Only then can we understand that God is not the source of our punishment, but the source of the remedy for evil in Jesus Christ. In just a few moments, we're going to baptize two children into that life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We're going to express our faith and our commitment to a God who brings us life eternal. And our discipleship in Christ allows us then to confront the evil in our lives because ultimately we are confident that God has already provided a remedy in Jesus Christ. The fig tree, the pagan king, and the cross of Jesus Christ all have one thing in common, a compassionate God who provides for the remedy of evil even before it happens 
and even by the very same instrument of that evil. A fig tree, a pagan king, and the cross of Jesus Christ. Just imagine what God can do with the brokenness in your life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him might not perish, but might have eternal life. Amen. Amen.